Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming um, to this, uh, this edition of the ZSR Library Lecture Series. My name is Roz Tedford. I am um, Director for Research and Instruction here, but I am the Liaison for Politics and International Affairs, so it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. And here's what uh, you need to know about him, for those of you who don't already know him. Um, John Dynan's research focuses on state constitutionalism, federalism, and American political development. He's the author of several books, including The American State Constitutional Tradition and Keeping the People's Liberties, Legislators, Citizens, and Judges and gu as Guard. Oh, sorry. That's two different books, isn't it? Keeping the People's Liberties, Legislators, Citizens, and Judges, full stop, and Guardians of Rights um, is a separate title. He writes an annual entry for state constitutional developments for the Book of the States, and he's the editor of Publius, the Journal of Federalism, and a past chair of the Federalism and Intergovernmental Relations section of the American Political Science Association. He received um, all three of his degrees from the University of Virginia, uh, BA, MA, and PhD. And he's currently this semester um, teaching two classes um, on elections, one on political parties, voters, and elections, and one on the US um, election system. So we were super excited to have John here to talk about the darndest political um, <laughs> campaign season I can remember. So I can't wait to hear what he has to say. He'll speak for a while, and then there'll be plenty of time um, at the end to ask um, all of the questions you might have about what's going on. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Roz, for that introduction. And thanks. I'm glad to be a part of the library lecture series. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks to everyone who showed up for this. I, um, as Roz mentioned, it's the darndest political season, <laughs> isn't it? Um, in fact, it's by now become quite common in discussing the 2016 election to really put a lot of the focus, rightly so, on these novel, unprecedented, the surprising aspects of 2016 election. And there's certainly ample material to choose from in terms of what's been that novelty at an unprecedented level. Just consider the, the presidential nominating process, just to take us back a few months here. Um, very few analysts poll the analysts in the summer of 2015 and asked them if they thought that Donald Trump would win the Republican nomination. And the response is that you would get a, not as a political outsider, a complete political outsider, not when the Republican leadership and office holders so strongly opposed him. We have books on this. The leading book on the topic is called The Party Decides. And the point is party insiders control the nomination process at the end of the day. And so there's good reason why political scientists last summer, if you'd asked them, could Donald Trump overcome those obstacles, they would have responded with great difficulty only. And of course, Trump did win the nomination, as we know. The Democratic contest, it didn't offer such a surprise in terms of the ultimate outcome, of course. Hillary Clinton had the support of Democratic Party leaders, office holders, and so as expected, she prevailed. The surprise there wasn't in the outcome. It was the strength of Bernie Sanders showing if you would ask political scientists in the summer of 2015, so could Bernie Sanders make a co competitive go of it? They would have given all the reasons that they gave for doubting that Donald Trump could make a go of it, and yet Sanders made a very competitive showing of it. And that's just in the nomination phase alone. General election campaign, we've also produced a fair number of unexpected and surprising features, and I'm not even talking about the events of the last week with a <laughs> tape coming out, uh, purloined emails from WikiLeaks. I'm saying even before these events, political scientists were stressing the unusual aspects of the 2016 election. They were talking, for instance, as has been often noted, the unprecedented high unfavorability rating of the two major party candidates or the unprecedented level of interest in the campaign. 84 million people tuned in to watch the first presidential debate. That's a record. A little bit down for the second debate, a little bit down for a lot down, actually, for the vice presidential debate. But still, these and other features have been surprising and have caught folks' attention. In fact, things got to a point this past spring. A Wake Forest graduate of the politics department, about 10 years ago, it graduated. He remarked in a conversation that he, um, he wanted his money back for his Wake Forest degree. <laughs> when pressed on why, wait, wait. he said his political science classes just hadn't prepared him <laughs> for what was happening. <laughs> this was the nomination phase especially. <sighs> and so he said he wasn't sure he'd gotten all that much for his tuition at the end of the day. Um, I think he took five classes with me, and so I took this particularly <laughs> to heart in, in terms of wondering about this. Um, 
Now, obviously, this, this Wake alum was offering this comment in a joking fashion. It was meant to express surprise that political science patterns had been frustrated, or at least hadn't panned out, particularly in the nomination phase. That's when this conversation took place. But as a political scientist who teaches courses on campaigns and elections, as Roz mentioned, I also I took the remark, lighthearted as it was, as an opportunity to reflect in a sustained fashion on the ways that political science might be able to explain what we're seeing in the 2016 election and the ways that political science might provide us good guidance on the developments that we see. And so that's what I plan to do today, to share the conclusions that this kind of a, this, this sustained consideration of, well, how might political science be helpful to understanding what we're seeing. And I'm going to focus mostly on the general election as I do so. I'm glad in the question and answer period to kind of field questions about the nomination phase, because I think political scientists can say some things about why the nominations turned out the way they did. I don't think we're completely disarmed in our ability to look back and explain things. And so I'd be glad to talk about that more. But I'm going to focus mostly on the general election campaign that we're in the midst of. I should say, I know this is a contrarian position to take, not to emphasize the novel and unprecedented features of the 2016 election, but the ways that political science patterns can explain and are borne out this year. But I thought taking this approach today might be helpful, if only as a way of showing Wake alums and perhaps Wake <laughs> current Wake Forest students that they, <laughs> the time and resources devoted to political science classes are, are not without their, their benefits and, and merits at the end of the day, but also as a way of perhaps helping us make sense of perhaps some otherwise surprising features of what we're, what we're seeing today. I should say I find this approach, um, others have focused um, a great deal on forecasting election results. What should we see? I've, I've generally steered clear of that, perhaps because when I have entered in that direction, I haven't been so good at it in that <laughs> sense. But, but I also think that political science maybe is, is best when we're not necessarily forecasting, but we're trying to make sense of events that we're in the midst of. And so with that all said by way of introduction, let me launch in. Uh, let me focus on four particular features of the 2016 general election where I see that we can have some continuity between 2016 and prior years and where political science patterns can help us explain what we're seeing. First, I want to focus on the dominant campaign strategies of the Trump and Clinton campaign. Two, I want to focus on the negativity of the campaign appeals that we're seeing this year. Third, I want to focus on the role of third parties this year. And fourth, I want to focus on the relationship between the presidential campaigns and down-ballot campaigns, campaigns for Congress, for governor. With that being said, let me launch into the, each of these points. And the first area of continuity that I would argue between 2016 and prior election years is concerning the overall strategies of the two campaigns. And let me provide some background here for this point. When political scientists try to analyze election outcomes, presidential outcomes in particular, and they have their models. And one of the first things they put in their models, they say, well, how's the economy doing? Is the economy doing well? If it is, that's going to help the in-power party, in this case, the Democratic Party. If it's not doing so well, it's another matter. A second variable that is often included in these models, they say, well, how's the approval rating of the current incumbent president? If that's high, that probably go looks good for the candidate running from that president's party. These are standard in the models. But then there's another variable that often gets included. It's called a time for a change variable. And it essentially says it gives an advantage to the out of power party when the in power party has served two terms. Not one term. One term, that gives the advantage to the party, the incumbent. But two terms, that's another matter. The idea here behind these models is that there's a perennial desire on the part of the American public for change of some kind, for change in rotation in office, particularly after one party has served two terms. One indication of this, since the end of World War II, only one time has a party won three consecutive terms. George H.W. Bush succeeded Ronald Reagan in 1988. Hasn't happened, though, otherwise. That's, that's, the, that's the logic behind the, the time for a change variable. Well, my point is that this pattern has significant implications for the strategies that the campaigns generally adopt. We almost always see the out-of-power party frame the election as a change election when they s put themselves in that situation. The other party's been for two terms. And then we see the in-power party try to resist that frame in some fashion, 
sometimes with some difficulty, but the idea is how do you choose another frame other than the change frame? As that party tries to hold together the prior President's coalition, but make some nod to the public's periodic desire for change. I would argue that's exactly the frame that we're seeing adopt this year. Think about if we had to distill down what's the do dominant strategy that the Trump campaign has adopted. It fits exactly with this time for a change theme, along with a related everything's going in the wrong direction theme. That's what you would expect when a party's been out of power for two offices. It can be seen in a way, and I stress the in a way, as akin to what we saw eight years ago when Barack Obama's campaign running against George W. Bush, who had been in office for two terms. Clearly, the substantive positions of the Obama and the Trump campaign are almost non-comparable. But my point is, think about it this way. Appeal to the electorate's enduring desire for periodic change and rotation. Stress the ways in which the country is not on the right track. Stress the ways that you as a candidate can be an engine for change in that context. To the extent that Trump is successful in framing the election in this way, in a change environment, it works somewhat to his advantage. Now consider the challenges faced by candidates such as Hillary Clinton when your party has served for two terms. What do you do in this situation? Candidates in this situation fa face several choices. One is to embrace the change theme, but embrace it in a way that doesn't disturb your president's, your party's coalition. Hillary Clinton's campaign has done a little bit about of this, um, emphasizing the historical argument, first woman president. That's change, you say. But I wouldn't say that's the dominant approach the Clinton campaign has took, taken. I might say that has actually played less of a role than one might have thought in the campaign in terms of its, its salience. I don't think that's dominated. But then there's a second option of the various options if you're running in a change year and you're parties holding the office, and I'd say this is what the Clinton campaign has generally emphasized. Shift the frame. Don't make it a referendum on change. Make the election a referendum on the other candidate, their fitness for office. Clinton has generally adopted this frame, really tried to cede the spotlight to Trump as much as possible. Certainly a bit of a lighter campaign schedule then Trump, if you turn on cable news, it seems there's always kind of a Trump rally out there that you could tune into. A little bit more selective, though, the Clinton campaign in their appearances in that regard. Best in this regard, if you're going to adopt this approach of the Clinton campaign, turn the attention to keep the spotlight on the other candidate and on that candidate's fitness for office. And certainly Trump's behavior has given a lot of grist for someone who would make the election a campaign on the opponent's fitness for office. To the extent that the Clinton campaign is successful at keeping the spotlight on Trump and making the election referendum on its fitness, the Clinton campaign is advantaged. This might be seen, having introduced this overall frame and suggesting there's more continuity than difference in this overall strategies. Let me turn our attention to look at the debates that have been held so far and also kind of look ahead to the third debate. And what I always do when I watch debates is, where do the candidates want to take the conversation? So I always want to look at for it. I want to suggest that as a, as a way. What are the questions that the candidate particularly wants to receive and respond to? Because some questions they, they're eager to answer. But then what happens when you get a question that you're not eager to answer? Where do you want to turn the conversation? Where do you want to take it rather than where it's answered? So I can, if we look at where does Trump want to take the, what is he trying to accomplish when he's had the floor in the debates? He's always emphasizing how the current situation is in bad shape. He said African American communities, he said, have never been as bad shape as they've been in. He said jobs have been loot, loot being lost at a, at a rate we haven't seen before. He said the country is weak abroad. These are the claims. Just what you would expect from a candidate adopting the change frame in that regard. And then think of Clinton's strategy. When she has the floor in the debates, what does she do? Oftentimes, it's turn the question to Trump's readiness, Trump's fitness. Keep the spotlight on there, just in keeping with this dominant frame. Are there other strategies? I don't want to say that this is the entire distillation of the campaign. Are there other strategies that the two campaigns pursue in the debates in terms of the issues they want to highlight? 
the questions they want to jump on or the questions they want to avoid. Yes, it's not entirely change versus fitness. Think of where Trump tries to turn the conversation. He wants to turn the conversation to the Supreme Court vacancy. He's the one that usually leaps to talk about that more. He's the one, interesting enough, who wants to take the conversation to health care policy and the Affordable Care Act. That's where he wants the conversation to go. He wants to take the conversation, obviously, to immigration policy and, and, and in line with some of his views. Or he's the one who wants to take the questions about energy exploration. You might recall that's why Ken Bone's question, the second debate, was so teed up for Trump. You might not remember the question so much. You might be so focused on the output of, of <laughs> Mr. Bone. That might be what most sticks in your mind is this colorful outfit. But what was Bone's question about? It was about energy exploration. And Trump said, oh, that's a question teed up for Trump. He said, oh, let me talk about that. Where does, where does Hillary Clinton want to take the conversation when she has a chance, aside from Trump's fitness for office, minimum wage increase? affordable college education, those would be the go-to types of issues. In short, I don't want to leave the idea that this is entirely a battle of a change theme versus a fitness for office theme. There's other issues. But I'd say that's the dominant frame. And I'd say in that respect, 2016 can be seen as continuous with rather than a big departure from similar situations where one party's been in office for two terms. Second area of continuity for 2016 and prior elections is in regard to the negativity of the two campaigns. And I mean negativity in a particular respect, and let me, let me explain. I mean it in the sense that even more than stressing their stances on their own issues, Trump and Clinton spend their time attacking the other candidates' issues and policies. It can be seen in the debates. It can be seen in the campaign advertisements, which are at least as likely, if not much more likely, to be attacking the other candidate as expressing a positive message about their own plans and policies. My point is that this type of negativity point that people are talking about goes beyond and is even in some ways different from the standard comment about the harshness of campaign appeals. This, after all, is goes back to 1800, at least, with Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and the harshness of their of, of their of, of the attacks or their surrogates attacks at least on the other candidate. We can go back to 1800 and there's some really harsh claims. No, rather the concern here isn't so much the harshness, it's on the amount and the fraction of time that's spent criticizing the opposing candidate rather than focusing on the positive aspects of your own policies. My, many people have commented on this about 2016 as feature. Upon consideration though, I would say that there's very little that's surprising about this aspect, not only because of the historically high unfavorable rating of the two candidates, but because of the era of partisan polarization in which we are currently living. The point is that we are now, focusing on the partisan polarization point, we are now and we have for several decades seen an increasing polarization of the American public along party lines. And moreover, here's a key insight that has come out for some recent polling that's been done. Pew Research Center has been a leader in these polls. The polarization that we see is not associated with voters being drawn to their own party. It's not because they love their own party. It's because they're opposed to fear, one might say loathing isn't too strong, of the other party. Let me explain. One way of charting this polarization over time that we've seen is to look at survey responses to questions. They ask people, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the other party? And what's the intensity of that feeling? As recently as the mid-1990s, only about one in five Republicans had a very unfavorable view of the Democratic Party, and vice versa. Only one in five said, I have a very unfavorable view in the mid-1990s. By this summer, a poll taken in summer 2016, over half of Republicans and half of Democrats said they had a very unfavorable view of the other party. My point is it wasn't always thus. That's, that's a change in just that two-decade period. I'll give a few further questions and results. A further question asked how many people would go so far within this group of very unfavorable, would you go so far as to agree that, quote, 
the other party's policies are so misguided that they threaten the nation's well-being. This summer, a full 45 percent of Republicans held this view of the Democratic Party, and a full 41 percent of Democrats held that view of the Republican Party. And these numbers, these numbers I just gave you, they increased by about 10 percentage points in each case in just the last two years since they last took that poll in 2014. In fact, one more on this. When asked a different set of questions in the same survey, just over half or close to half of Republicans and Democrats in the general public report that the other party makes them feel afraid, angry, and frustrated. These are adjectives that people used, with frustrated scoring the highest, afraid scoring next highest, and angry scoring just behind. Such is the level of antipathy for the other party in the electorate these days. Perhaps the most disturbing finding, this was most disturbing to me, came when they asked people, they said, when you have conversations with the people across the political aisle, a Democrat talks to a Republican and vice versa, do you leave that conversation realizing or thinking that you had more in common with that person than you realized before the conversation or less in common? Nearly twice as many people reported they left those conversations thinking they had even less in common with that person than before the conversation started in comparison with people who said, I realized I had more in common. As I say, that's perhaps the most disturbing um, of the, of the st statistics that I've just given you there. We often have the sense that if we could just talk to people across party aisles, at least that would be the way out. At least these statistics suggest maybe not, maybe not. But, and to get to the point I want to draw out here, we are a deeply polarized nation and becoming more polarized. But what's perhaps less appreciated, as I indicated a few minutes ago, this growing polarization is not driven by a public's love or support for their own party, but by opposition to the other party. One final statistic just to hammer this home. The same surveys that I've given you this summer, they asked people, why do you identify as a Republican if you're a Republican? Why do you identify as a Democrat if you're a Democrat? Among Republican respondents, their leading reason was because of opposition to Democratic policies. It's not, I like Republican policies. That came in second. But the first one was, why are you Republican? Because I don't like Democratic policies. When they asked Democrats, it came in second place. That by a very small margin, Democrats said, why are we Democrats? My leading reason is because I like Democratic Party policy. But just a few percentage points behind was, I dislike, my reason is I dislike the Republican policies. In this context, what do you do if you're a campaign in a polarized era where what's driving people is opposition to the other party? Your ad, your campaign appeals will be drawn to emphasizing what's wrong with the other party and not touting what's beneficial about your own party. In this sense, entirely to be expected, the fraction of energy that's being spent criticizing the other side rather than touting your own policies. Let me turn to a third area of continuity. It's in the role of third parties. You might think this is just the year in such a situation where third parties will have a good go of it. Shouldn't it be, given the high unfavorability ratings of the two major party candidates. And so there's been much talk about libertarian candidate Gary Johnson, Green Party candidate Jill Stein, Evan McMullen is on some ballots in some states. And yet, drawing on the performance of prior third party candidates, political scientists would not have an expectation that the third parties, even in a year such as this one, would have a very good showing. I, Third party presidential candidates, simply put, they face tremendous obstacles in the U.S. political system. They're often short on funding. They face difficulty in even getting on the ballots of the 50 states. Gary Johnson is on the ballot in North Carolina. Jill Stein is not on the North Carolina ballot. You can write Jill Stein in, but it's not on the ballot. And they're often kept out of the debates. And then there's the perennial voter concern about casting a wasted vote. And so inevitably, the dominant pattern, third party candidates might poll somewhat well early stages of the campaign. That's been yet generally fades as the campaign goes along. That's been the dominant pattern. Ross Perot in 1992 is the leading exception. 
where an independent candidate surged rather than faded in the clo campaign stretch. Ross Perot ended up winning nearly one out of every five votes cast in 1992. But he had a lot of money to overcome those concerns, and he got in the debates that year. Ross Perot got in the debates, cru a crucial. So he always over overcome some of those challenges, is my, is my point here. But that's the high watermark for third party candidates in recent years. Perot gets 19% of the vote in 1992. That is surpassed only by Teddy Roosevelt's 27% in 1912. Otherwise, that's the high water mark. Just consider, consider the last few elections. 2012, Gary Johnson and Jill Stein were both on the ballot in 2012. Johnson collected just about 1% of the vote. Stein got less than half of a percent of the vote. And in fact, this exceeded the support for third party candidates in 2008 and 2004. We have to go back to Ralph Nader's showing of just about 3% in the 2000 election. That's the last kind of semi-good showing of a third party candidate. And so even in 2016, as I say, Republican and candidate, Democratic candidates boast their unfavorable ratings. And there's more than the usual amount of focus on Libertarian and Green Party candidates especially. It's not surprising that Johnson or Stein both failed to get in the debates. They didn't have the 15% support that was needed to even get in the debates. And it would be just as surprising as a result if they actually picked up rather than lost support during the closing days of the campaign. It's a catch-22 to be sure, but if you can't get in the debates, you don't attract the attention you need. People focus on there, it's like, oh, those are the two candidates that count. If you don't get in the debates, but they say, well, I can't get in the debates, how do I get the attention? That's just the way it is. To be sure, I'm gonna close off here on this point, third-party candidates are likely to do better among certain groups and in certain states. Which groups do third party candidates do best among? Young people. That's the, mo the group, if you, it's, it's a kind of inverse relation to age. The older groups, less li least likely to support third party candidates, the youngest voters, most likely to do so. So I wouldn't be surprised if you kind of see on 2016, if you see kind of break down the exit polls, if young voters actually tick upwards above the norm. And perhaps in certain states, Utah voters in 1992, they actually ranked Ross Perot second out of the three candidates. It's the only state where Perot finished not third of the, of the three candidates. Um, and the inclina this inclination of Utah voters could be seen this year as well. Um, strong support in Utah for independent conservative candidate Evan McMullen, for instance. So you could see that tick upwards in a way. To, or um, some states just have practice in voting for independent candidates. Alaska currently has an independent governor. Alaska is the only one of the states that doesn't have a Democratic or Republican governor. Alaska has an independent. And so that shows Alaskans have a kind of a propensity. They're willing to kind of vote for third party candidates. So it wouldn't be a surprise to see Alaska voters kind of tick upwards. But overall, if history is any guide, even in a year such as 2016, the expectation is that overall support for the third party candidates, perhaps not that much different than the way it usually is, given the challenges they face. Let me turn to a fourth and final area of continuity between this year and previous years. And that is in the relationship between the presidential campaign and campaigns for what I'll call down ballot offices. U.S. Senate, U.S. House, governor, down ballot, top of the ticket, president, down ballot, these other races. In prior years, ticket splitting was a fairly common occurrence. Voters would cast a ballot for president, for one party, and then they cast a ballot for down ballot candidates for the other party. It happened on a regular enough basis. In recent decades, though, this has become quite rare. And so my overall point here, although there's much discussion about how candidates for governor, senator, or house member in North Carolina and other states might gain some distance from the top of the ticket, whether from Clinton or especially from Trump, these candidates also know that in practice, their fate depends heavily on how well their party's presidential candidate fares. Let me explain these points. Let me turn to the increasingly tight relationship between the presidential election and down ballot races. And perhaps the best way I can illustrate this is 435 House districts around the country. The last presidential election, only 26 of those districts was their difference between how that district voted for president and voted for the House. That means in 435 House districts, 409 of them went the same way for president 
and for House. There's not that much ticket splitting going on from those numbers. That's, in fact, a striking level of consistency in voting for president and then for voting for other offices. Now, there are still some split outcomes, as there were in the past. There were those 26 House races. Their um, correlation between party success for president and congressional races is certainly not an exact one. Think of West Virginia, a heavily Republican state in the presidential race, but elected Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. North Dakota, Republican state in the presidential race, Heidi Heitkamp, a Democratic senator. So it does happen. But my overall point is ticket splitting is generally on the wane. We just don't see it happen in the way that we used to. And so what this means is, to take the point, congressional candidates really have only a limited ability to separate themselves from their party's presidential candidate. Or perhaps the best way to put this is congressional candidates' efforts to gain distance from their party's presidential candidate are as likely to have the effect of hurting rather than helping their own chance of reelection. To be sure, congressional candidates have all kinds of ways of finessing the relationship with the top of the ticket. I mean, how do you do this? You say, well, I'll vote for the candidate, but I won't attend their nominating convention. I'll vote for them, but I won't appear alongside them at a rally. If I do appear at the rally, I won't be in a photo where we're in the same shot, in that sense. <laughs> There's all these stances that you take, and a lot of folks have had um, North, I should say that we've seen this in North Carolina in past years, where, where uh, oftentimes, is in previous years, it was Democratic candidates for governor, sometimes for, for Congress, who would kind of maintain a little bit of distance between the presidential uh, party. So we, it's not completely foreign in North Carolina, and we've certainly seen this in North Carolina this year, where Senate and governor candidates have been repeatedly asked, do you uh, criticize Hillary Clinton's email handling, or much more often, do you criticize Donald Trump's various incendiary comments? And what is your position on this? And what we've seen is candidates in North Carolina, and this is generally similar around the country, they've repeatedly condemned the actions and statements, but they've stopped short of saying, I withdraw my support, I, I won't be supporting. That's the stance that we've taken. Some commentators, they, they've responded to this and they've expressed surprise. They say, why haven't the candidates gone further? Why haven't they taken the step that you occasionally see and just say, I disavow my support for? Why this finesse it? Why this effort to kind of thread the needle in that way? But I would argue, in light of the decline of ticket splitting, this behavior to stick with the presidential candidate is entirely in keeping with what we'd expect from a congressional or down, other down ballot candidates. After all, congressional candidates have a very strong interest in their party's presidential candidate doing well. The number one factor that brings voters to the polls is still the presidential race. That's what drives the turnout. Enthusiasm for the president often then trickles down and leads people to then cast votes for other races. And so, yes, down ballot candidates, they can control their fate to some degree. They can finesse things. They can hope for some ticket splitting, and there will be some ticket splitting. But increasingly, let's look at the last two presidential election years. In 2008, Democrats swept everything in North Carolina that was on the ballot. They won the presidency. They won the governorship, and they won the Senate in 2008. 2012, Republicans won the presidency, and they won the governor. There wasn't a Senate race on the ballot that year. So yes, ticket splitting still takes place, but we're more struck by the continuity of what you see of these outcomes. In this context, then, my point is it makes sense and is understandable, as surprising and as frustrating as it might be, that candidates for Congress, for governor, still say, I condemn these actions, I criticize them, but I actually still hope that candidate wins and I'm, it's, it's not in my interest to actually distance myself so much from them. Well, I, in closing, I, I don't wanna, I, I focused on what can be explained by political science. I've done that in part to kind of, for the, for the honor of political science, it's to, <laughs> to say that we, we still have something to kind of offer, because I think we do have something to offer. Of course, there are the notable, the unusual features. Of course, they, we have a um, first female presidential candidate for one of the two major parties. High unfavorability ratings for both candidates, as we've stressed. But I, have a tr I, I, I suppose my point has been at a time when the focus of so much of the commentary has been on this novelty to turn back to a question of 
what can be explained and was continuous. And as I said, I do that not only for the kind of the, the honor of political science, but as I believe it might help us make sense of some of the developments that we're in the midst of, which otherwise might surprise us or puzzle us. Political scientists do have some explanations for, for these and other features. So thank you for your attention. Certainly, yes, please, Rob. I have a question. Yes. So, but it's going to be about something that I'm going to discuss a little differently here, and sure, I'd like your opinion on it, which is the impact of the fact that we have Sanders and Trump who weren't really party people, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Sanders wasn't really a Democrat, or Trump isn't really a Republican. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think those sort of long term impacts are on the sense of a party? I mean, you had the whole DNC problem on Hillary's side, and now you have Trump essentially completely separating himself from the party structure. So, yeah, I'm yeah. curious. The two primary parties going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, is how, how, how uh, it gives an opportunity to say, well, how would we even explain how well Trump did and how well did Sanders do in that time? And we'd have to start, for Trump, it's a little bit different from Sanders. For Trump, the party leaders clearly opposed him, right. but they didn't have, they didn't settle on an alternative. And that's a bit of the puzzle. We often assume that the party would have some of, they'd be putting forward. Who would you say, if you had to say, who did the party, if we say the party, support in the Republican nomination? Well, you might say it was Jeb Bush, certainly the money was there. Or was it Marco Rubio? Some would say that. Or was it by the end of the time, Ted Cruz was actually having the support. And so in part, it was a divided party that allowed that to happen. Um, and and in, 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 in the case of, of Sanders, it wasn't a divided party for the most part. You know, we've seen situations, one of the things about American political parties, uh, they're remarkably porous in a way. In fact, this links up, why have third parties not done better? Because the two parties adapt and kind of pull in. When Ross Perot got one out of every five votes in 1992, parties started saying, and why exactly were people voting for Perot, they said? Maybe we should be listening to this. And so you start pulling in some of these ideas. And so that's one of the reasons why two parties are um, are remarkably enduring is because they adapt. And I would expect a similar adaptation to take place in this regard. It's an unclear. What people say, well, after the 2016 election, regardless of the outcome, um, does Trump change the party, for instance? Do they, do they adapt to, to things? Perhaps in some ways, perhaps um, on immigration or on trade issues particularly, the party has most of the trade deals have gotten the vast majority of their votes from the Republican Party more so than the Democratic Party when we actually see this. It's oftentimes the Republicans put a good amount of votes forward and then they kind of pull some Democrats along. Does that still happen after, after uh, 2016? Um, that, that's, that's some of the areas where you would see the party kind of changing and, and adapting it, itself to it. I suppose just the one other thing, and then I'll stop on this because there's much more to be said is, one indication of how much the party could change is we didn't just have primaries for president this year. We were following a lot of primaries for congressional office in that way. And there were a number of candidates who said, I'm a Trump-like candidate here in that sense. You saw those candidates. We had in the North Carolina Senate race a candidate, who, Greg Brandon, who said, I'm, um, if, if you like Donald Trump, you, know, you should vote for me in that sense. You shouldn't be voting for Richard Burr because if you're voting for Trump, you want me as well. Didn't do any well at all. I mean, really did a very poor performance. And we could see that happening in similar races around the country where Kennedy said, um, you know, I, I'm aligned with Trump. That gives one pause about seeing a whole lot of, um, of, um, of staying power and of actually changing power. Because if it was going to really change the party in a way that you'd see the party change dramatically, not just respond on a few issues such as trade or otherwise, you would have wanted to see or expected to see a lot of these other nominations where Trump-type candidates prevailed, and we didn't see that in the way. Yes, please. Please. So I was really curious about um, Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Senate is certainly in, in play, very much in play. They, um, uh, currently, it's 54 folks caucus with the Republicans, 46 caucus with the Democrats. I say caucus because I don't say Democrats. There's really only 44 Democrats and two others that caucus with the Democrats, but for practical purposes, um, that's being said. So if, uh, if Democrats win the White House and they pick up four seats, a 50-50 tie means that Democrats control the Senate. 
nobody ever really controls the Senate, as I say. <laughs> they say that um, to, to, lead, to be a s leader of the Senate, as one Senate majority leader said, is like herding cats in that sense, um, for various reasons. But, but you would have formal control over the Senate. Can, um, can de Democrats see four states where that's possible? Very much so. Um, they, they, one basically looks around at battleground states in the presidential level at where there's also a Senate race going on. Um, not entirely, but one, one, one starts from states uh, uh, such, such as Pennsylvania, uh, states such as New Hampshire, North Carolina have clearly been getting a good amount of attention. Not entirely. What's interesting about this, I said ticket splitting is on the wane, but it's still there. One place where you might think that there'd be a more competitive pickup would be Ohio, where Ohio is a battleground state, and you have a Republican first-term incumbent, Rob Portman. Turns out that that race is basically over at this point, as Democrats are basically seeding the field in a way. Portman did a more effective job of distancing se himself and finessing the relationship between him and the National Party to a way that very few others have done. But take Ohio out there, you still have plenty of states. Could you see four of those um, states going Democratic without too much difficulty? It's not to say it will happen, but without too much difficulty. On the other hand, the House of Representatives is a far tougher nut to crack. There, Republicans have a 29-seat advantage. And simply put, um, there's not that many more than 29 kind of competitive seats that are, that are, you would have to have a real wave election, which is not outside of the realm of possibility, but things would have to be surprising in that level. We just, we just don't have that number of competitive races, and so um, that would be more of a surprise if that happened. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's tough to find an exact parallel in this case. <laughs> um, I, in focusing on kind of these things that political scientists are prepared with patterns to get, we'd have to reach pretty far to find out something of that kind. There's always been cases where you've had, um, and this is particularly going back several decades, where the Democratic Party was an uneasy mix of a Northeastern liberal party and a Southern conservative bloc at which there would be some friction between those two blocks, and it would be not at all surprising to see um, candidates kind of uh, th themselves kind of distancing themselves from the party. But, but in the case of, of, of party leaders doing so, um, we'd have to reach pretty far back. In that sense, though, that's um, in some ways not a completely surprising outcome when the person that wins the nomination was opposed strongly by party leaders and party office holders. And so we haven't seen that situation before, so perhaps that's the explanation. Yes, please. Uh, you yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, one one thing just to kind of note on this, we always should note that one of the one of the debates that year took place at Wake Forest, in, in that sense. So uh, I always always good to 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 note that. I, I, I um, um, you know. We, one would have to go back and look at what were the conditions that made possible that, um, that otherwise surprising outcome in that way. Oh, in this case, things were in flux for actually for early in the campaign season. At first, it seemed that if you would uh, talk about political science predictions very early in the 1988 season, they would have given um, Michael Dukakis a, a very um, fighting chance, might even have seen him as kind of having a good chance of winning. There, things changed during the course of the campaign in, in that way. Um, in fact, some of the debates had a role to play in that, in that way. So it, it's not that, you, um, that, that that's faded to be in that way. Um, one, one might see that the, in the parallel with that is in that one of the debates in the political science literature is, does the campaign even really matter in presidential elections? This sounds surprising. What do you mean, does the campaign matter? But there are people who said, and you've seen political scientists put themselves out there, say, I have a model. I will predict for you how the, pro how the, how the election will turn out. I just need to know, as I made it not to, how's the economy doing? How's the incumbent president doing? How's a few other things? And so they say the campaign doesn't matter. Well, 1988 would be a case where the campaign does matter. One might say that 2016 is very possible that the campaign itself matters, that things happen during the course of missteps or particular appeals. That would be the parallel that I would draw between 2016 and 1988. Yes, please.
No, I, I take that point, and, and one, one place to, to build on that point is that so many uh, campaigns are about what are people talking about, what is the focus. I talked about the narratives, the themes in that way, and so much is the effort of, it's not so much, when we think about campaigns, it's not so much people talking to each other about common issues, it's about people saying, this is the issue that you should be talking about. This issue is favorable to me. I kind of mentioned that in the debates, how one of the candidates will say, oh, I want this to be about this issue, or the other candidate says, I want this to be about this issue. And so one way of taking this is that um, social media has a way of trying to elevate issues that, that various people would put that otherwise might not have gotten up there in the, in the discussion. I, I would say that the free trade issue is a classic example of that. I don't know that we fully expected a year ago at this point that the Trump appeal to bad trade deals, is concerned about that, and the Sanders concerned about trade would be so prominent and would strike such a chord as, as it did. Um, presumably that bubbled up from somewhere, perhaps from the rallies themselves and reactions that candidates got. The one thing I would say, though, is that it, it's still, yes, social media still has a way of kind of sending up issues and putting them in the public consciousness, but uh, uh, the, what we call the kind of the, the, the traditional media, and particularly in the debates, where, where the, the ability to kind of put issues on people's discussion by just what you ask in debate questions. And so they've already announced, for instance, the third and final presidential debate, to which we'll all turn our attention to. Um, uh, they've already announced here the topics for the debates, in that sense. Here's the six topics. One of those topics is immigration. Donald Trump is happy to hear that. Another topic is the Supreme Court. I said Donald Trump was happy to hear that. There's some other issues that the Clinton campaign would be happy about, the economy, for instance. But my point is there is it's that still the stage is set in, a, in an important way by, by, by traditional media, even if there's opportunities for, for putting things, for bubbling up issues that otherwise wouldn't get the attention. Still a mix. They, they have, and um, I've, I've mentioned some of these Pew Research Center uh, studies on several occasions, and I'll do so again because I just find them so rich. They have asked just those questions. They ask where are people getting their news, and then they break it down by age, by party. It won't surprise you that we're very polarized in where we go for, for news by various cable outlets or the otherwise. That's no surprise to us. But, and it probably won't be all the end surprising, but it would confirm the, the, um, the, the what your suggestion there is just where people above the age of 65, even pe people the age of 45 are going for their, their news is dramatically different from the, from, from the places that people under the age of 25 and 30 are going for news. I mean, um, there's still people that read newspapers, and, and, and it's still done, um, but that varies dramatically by age. Um, there's still, um, there's even the cable um, uh, audience is, is, is a heavily um, dominated by, but not by dominated by younger people for the most part. So we're talking about just kind of even completely different audiences in terms of where people are getting their news from. We really are in, in different silos there. Again, not only by partisan and ideo ideological inclination, we know that, but even by, by age group. Yes, please. Uh, on the, do the newspaper world have any Yeah. You know, th in a general election, as opposed to a general presidential election in particular, where likely expectation there is that they would have the least amount of influence compared with some other elections. How about, we had in, um, in this area, we had a new congressional district, the 13th congressional district, it was just created this spring, a result of a court case. And we had 17 Republican candidates running for, 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 for that district. 
Well, how are people going to get their information about that from? That would be a time where a newspaper endorsement could have maximum influence because you're trying to decide, okay, how do I make sense of a lot of candidates I don't know about? At the presidential level, though, people have much more confidence level of I know these, these candidates and I'm, I'm, I feel more confident about my own ability. So I would say endorsements have varying levels of influence as opposed to, say, um, for instance, a, a, uh, a local city council race or a, or a mayor race or particularly a nonpartisan race of that kind. Where there, a newspaper endorsement, think of the judges that are running for North Carolina, where there are nonpartisan judges. If you want to, you can go on the Republican Party website, the Democratic Party website, and they'll say, here's the judges we back. But for people who aren't going on the website, there, a newspaper endorsement might be your best source of information. So I'd, I'd give it a gradation or a variation in terms of where endorsements are maximum influence and where they're probably modest influence. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's certainly been discussion uh, about that. There's no doubt that if you would, um, you know, Donald Trump and his campaign, his his his. His promise is, he says, I brought different and new voters into the Republican Party. Um, again, the challenge is, uh, are they voting for Donald Trump or, 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 or are, they vote, are they pulled in by the Republican Party? <laughs> you know, for, 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 as I mentioned, some candidates who ran for congressional primaries or Senate primaries didn't seem to, to benefit in that, in that same way. And so that leads me to, to have more pessimism or at least to, 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 to not see that as a long-term change. That being said, the presidential vote is the most important one that influences you down the ballot. That's why if we talk about North Carolina and other southern states that went through a realignment from the, in terms of party level, North Carolina, once part of the solid Democratic South, how did the change take place? It started taking place, first of all, at the presidential level. A number of people in North Carolina more started voting Republican for president. Still, though, they'd be voting Democratic for governor. They would very comfortable doing that. <laughs> Still voting Democratic for a number of, certainly for state legislatures, for, for members of Congress. And then at a certain point, kind of things started being brought in line. The general thing is, well, if I keep voting for Republican for president, why, why, maybe I should be or I feel comfortable voting for other offices. Same thing happened in the Northeast, where you had for a long time, you had traditional um, Republicans were in control of state legislatures, but then people started voting in the New England New England was actually the strongest point for a Democratic Party back in some of the 1930s when they had some of the toughest things. And people started saying, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, vo I'm, I'm now in Northeast, I'm voting Democratic for president. Why am I still voting Republican for governor? Why am I still casting these votes? And so they come in line. So it's a long way of saying a vote for cast for president is important in that sense. And if it gets, if some of the folks that Trump has brought into the party, we'll see how numerous those are, but if some of those folks not only vote Republican this year, but vote Republican 2020, then we might start be seeing a long-term effect. Until that happens, though, I, I, I remain um, skeptical of major changes, or at least to be determined. Okay. Yes, please. No, that would, that, would, that would be missing. And, and I, I, I use that as one of the strategies, though. But here's the other strategy that you can do if you're in that situation, and this actually comes closest to what George H.W. Bush used successfully in 1988. One is you turn the attention and you say, you say, well, the other candidate's not fit for office. But in this case, in the case of George H.W. Bush, it was the other candidate is too liberal for office, is what it says. And so there you still have an ideological frame that you could use. So one can imagine if Ted Cruz had prevailed in the final days of the nomination, one could imagine the frame being turned to here. It's not so much about whether it's time for change or not. It's whether this candidate is too ideologically different from you. And so that would remain. So I, I think there's flexibility in then how you, how you deal with with a, um, when you're the party, the candidate running for the third term, there's different ways you can turn the attention and reframe it, and I expect that would be the different reframing. Okay. 
Good.